focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas presents CNBC TV18, The Thought League, Season 2. Hello and welcome to The Thought League, Season 2. At the outset, I would like to thank our viewers and all the global thought leaders who participated in the first season and the resounding success of the first season gave us all the inspiration of embarking on this exciting journey of ideas for change to stay ahead of the curve once again. Let me welcome on the show the constant force behind the Thought League, Cyril Shroff, the managing partner at Cyril Amarchand Mangal Das. And today we are discussing the changing geopolitics and geoeconomics of the world and its impact. And let me welcome on the show Janmaya Sinha, who is the chairman in India of Boston Consulting Group. Gentlemen, so good to have you on CNBC TV 18. My first question to you, Janmaya Sinha. How do you see the shifting role of geopolitics and therefore geoeconomics in the world, in the present world today? It's a pleasure to be here. And the question that you ask uh, is an important one and is quite distinct from the earlier images that we have of the Cold War. You know, when there was the Cold War between Soviet Union and the U US, it was very clear that there were two blocks. I think the dimension of geopolitics has evolved. And now there will be areas of cooperation, areas of accentuated competition, and areas of conflict. And in this, partners will shift in different spaces. And in fact, the evolution of the future will be formed and framed within the context and the construct of which area do you fall into. So there will be cooperation in the areas of climate, of health, possibly space, and even nuclear. Competition will carry on as before with tariffs and investment norms that will be there and labor movements that will be restricted. And there will be conflict in technology, because there will be issues around standards, which will actually be distinct because the regime types will be different. You know, privacy in an authoritarian regime is different from privacy in a liberal democracy. So issues around data localization, around monopolies, about taxation, around immigration, around cyber, around sanctions, will all be areas which will lead maybe to conflict and the creation of different blocks in the technology sphere. So within this is what we will see the emergence of the new geopolitics. And in this, you know, there will be areas which countries like India will in some places be cooperating, in other places be competing, and in some places being very, very careful about the areas and issues that they will face conflict on. Right. So that's just an overall framing of the geopolitics of our time. Of course, this has very immediate and clear implications on, 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 on global economy, because you know just the last 20 years, and the, certainly the first 15 in this century, was about integrated supply chains. But once you start to see this unravel, people start to worry about their dependence on any one nation. So, you know, you've, we've all heard about the China plus one strategy in respect to supply chains. And so even in the areas of competition, people will include risk uh, and geopolitical risk in their calculus. Right. And then there will be other areas where, uh, you know, you will continue to cooperate. That's of course, I believe that this creates an opportunity for a, a country like India, because if you were to take an, uh, 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 an index like the uh, MSCI index for emerging markets, earlier it used to be 50% China and say 8% India. When you start to balance risk, that 50% for China may come down to 40%, and India may go up from 8 to 12 or 13%, 
and, and so you know more money starts to become available. So I think That's the right. overall context hmm. is a major change from you know the previous structures uh, that we were used to when there were two superpowers uh, uh, in the mix. That's right, uh, Janmya Sena, you have put it uh, so well and you've set the agenda for the entire discussion. The biggest takeaway coming in from there is that the global warfare tools have changed as the world goes through a structural shift. Uh, Cyril Shroff, what do you make of this shift in power globally that we are experiencing right now? So uh, thanks, uh, Nisha, and uh, delighted to be back on uh, season 2.0. To quote uh, Farid Zakaria, uh, the future, we are not going to see a cold war, but we are more likely to see a cold peace. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, one is, of course, some of the things that Janmay mentioned, new digital and biological battlefields, globalization 2.0 and the rise of nationalism the substitution of bilateralism with uh, multilateralism. And also in, in this era, uh, there, we have to be sort of conscious of the fact that uh, there is a lot of interdependence of economies. USA made China in the post Deng Xiaoping uh, era. And uh, there will be, as uh, he said, there will be both cooperation and conflict at the same time. Now, optically, uh, what's called uh, Chimerica seems unsustainable. But decoupling, I think, is almost impossible because of consumers, uh, large manufacturing capacity in China, and the China plus one strategy can only solve a part of the problem. I think uh, China is so far ahead and the cost benefits are so high that it's going to be very difficult. For example, take something as simple as solar panels. Now, as the, as the world moves to sustainability, the cheapest panels are made uh, in China. How are you going to substitute that overnight? And then there is another aspect also. I mean, I would call it uh, geotechnology. Uh, and uh, I, I think the, the philosophically, there is there are two kind of alliances building. The USA-led one is an alliance of techno-democracies. And uh, the ones which are in the sort of China orbit are the alliances of, uh, of uh, techno-autocracies building on some of the points that were raised. And hence, there will be a reset of a lot of international frameworks, whether they be on privacy, freedom of speech, competition and antitrust laws, cyber protocols, taxation, immigration, the, the works. And the nature of war itself has changed. We're not going to see uh, uh, sort of wars between these two big blocks necessarily being fought with tanks and missiles they're more likely to be fought in cyberspace and biological space and financial space. Yes. I think economic yes. uh, economic uh, wars are kind of uh, more likely. And I think we'll touch upon it. Uh, I think the role of the USA has also dramatically changed and we should talk about that uh, in a bit, yes. but I'll stop here. Right, uh, so you mentioned America and you also mentioned the importance of China in the global scenario. In the recent past, Janme Sina, we have seen several aspects in China affecting global trade. There have been carbon emission concerns, there was supply chain disruption, so therefore the chip shortage and even power shortage is impacting the entire world. Is a true decoupling from China really possible? I don't even know that it's you know, the term decoupling has to be unraveled because there are areas of uh, integration which no one wants to decouple. And I mean, if you look at it, in 2000, China was a trillion dollar economy. Today, it's a 15 trillion dollar economy. So it is, and you know, if you take the globe and we say it's about 86 or 88 trillion dollars of global GDP, about 20 trillion is in the US and about 15 trillion is in China. So that's 35 trillion. And so that's more than a third in just these two countries. So a decoupling becomes uh, unwieldy, especially when the first decade of this century was about coupling, you know, integrating supply chains. So what countries are going to start doing is to try and evaluate the extent of dependence in different areas. 
how much do I export? You know, is it more than 75%? Is it more than 50%? Is it more than 25% from one country? And do I want to be that dependent? So if I'm importing more than 75% from one country, how do I reduce my dependence? Yes. So that I can't get caught off guard. Right. But the lower than that, I'm comfortable because both countries need each other. Yes. And so as Cyril was saying, the future will be around competitive edge, you know, and the competitive edge is going to be driven largely by technology. And, and you know, uh, and if you just look at technology and we divide it into four different buckets of hardware, of software products, of software services, and of data, there will be extreme competition in each of these areas. With winners and losers shifting. That's right, a global shift is taking place and that's why probably to protect uh, the Indian interest, the government also came up with Atmanirbhar Bharat also to reduce the dependence. But how is India positioned in this global reset of geopolitics and geoeconomics? We'll discuss that after a very short break on the Thought League. Stay tuned. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas presents CNBC TV 18, The Thought League, Season 2. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas presents CNBC TV 18, The Thought League, Season 2. Welcome back. Uh, you're watching the Thought League and we are discussing the impact of the shift in geopolitics and geoeconomics on India and across the world. Now, Cyril Shroff, we were discussing the role of the U.S. After the pandemic, one and a half years have seen major changes in global economy. Afghanistan has taken place and Joe Biden is at the helm. What are the key parameters on which now U.S. is working as a superpower? So the Afghan uh, withdrawal is only one facet of the new American doctrine. But at a simple level, I think what it means is that America is not going to sort of engage in wars uh, halfway across the world merely based on ideology unless it sees a direct threat or a danger to itself. And more importantly, uh, I think it does not see itself necessarily as a global super cop. Instead, I think it is evolving a new doctrine of influence. Hmm. The Quad and the new AUKUS, uh, AUKUS, uh, both are examples of kind of alliances of democracies and the theatres of influence have also a strong Asian and an Eastern flavour. Whereas if you saw the, so saw the uh, sort of theatre of action uh, 50 years ago, it was more Europe-centric. But now not only has the East become more important, but maritime power has become also very uh, important. And India is at a very interesting juncture. Uh, particularly, it has it has now decisively moved away from the Soviet bloc. It is a very important non-treaty partner of the US bloc. And there's almost 180 degrees uh, change. And ideologically, I think because of our democracy and kind of essentially liberal posture, we have stronger ideological connections uh, with the US. Mm. But uh, we have to remember one thing, and I think as Henry Kissinger said that you know, America is a very dangerous enemy, but it is a fatal friend. So I think we have to sort of approach it with uh, with caution. And there are a lot of opportunities for for India. And uh, to build on that, I think we should uh, we should see what our own prime minister has said. And you know, there was an interesting piece last week on does India matter. Yes. And I think the answer yes. is yes because of three reasons: mm. demography, uh, demand, and democracy. And we'll talk about these uh, shortly. So I'll leave it at that. So India is going to be very important in the new kind of post uh, the, the, with the new America and its positioning in the world. Right. Uh, Janmaya Sinha, jump in on this particular point. How will India take this particular opportunity in its own stride and also at the same time protect its own interest? I actually feel that the situation for India has become fairly favorable. Whenever you are thinking about geopolitics, it is about power and consequence. How important are you and how much do you matter? And as you matter more, uh, you become more consequential and therefore you have a bigger voice. So India now is a $3 trillion economy. And so 
And if we really look at it, between 2000 and 2010, but for China's growth, India was the second best performer. With the tension between US and China, yes. the opportunity space for India expands. And it plays to a space where Indians have already pro proven and shown their capability. You know, Indians with in tech, in tech services have already been at the top. And if you look at different companies, two of the, uh, you know, five uh, uh, more than trillion dollar companies are headed by Indians, first generation. They went from India and now they are heading companies, you know, Alphabet and, and Microsoft. So it shows that the talent space for Indians is, is uh, quite propitious. And the U.S. is already getting scared. And this is by, uh, bipartisan. Both Republicans and Democrats are now seeing China as threat number one. So if China is seen as threat number one and India is the other uh, continental sized country which has that much data we have a lot to bring to the table not just our talent but also our consumers and also our data so in fact into Cyril's 3Ds I would add a fourth which is data it's really important and we have a lot of that data and it's growing every day and that data has incalculable value and we can bring that to the table, but we really need to become more powerful, know our own interest well, and then play to that so that we become consequential. So, you, Janmeh Sinha, you raised a very important point. There is a digital divide in the world as well. In fact, in the post-COVID era, digital divide and vaccine diplomacy and vaccine divide are coming up prominently dividing the countries. But I want to understand, what is the role of the global organizations in now, in Cyril Shroff's word, creating the cold peace for a collaborative opportunity that everybody is looking forward to? See, the, the multilateral institutions yes. were there in the pre, uh, you know, in the Cold War era were set up by the U.S., you know, post-World War II. And they had an underpinning of a liberal democratic order where all the power was. So U.S. and Europe had all the GDP, and they were mostly liberal democracies. Now, today, if you really look at it, the competition is between U.S. and China, and both U.S. and China are the tech powers in the world. But their regimes are very different. There's an authoritarian regime, and then there is a liberal democracy. So the standards on which you have to agree are fundamentally problematic. Hmm. And creating institutions to navigate this in the technology area is going to be difficult. So blocks may emerge. You know, on trade and tariffs and, uh, and immigration and capital, you can have the old institutions still playing a role. With regard to climate and health, the, it is becoming such a palpable problem across the world that everyone in their own self-interest might actually agree to cooperate yes. and agree on standards to cooperate around. Right. But in technology, this is going to be harder. Yes. So the role of these institutions, how to create them, how to craft them, is not going to be so straightforward. And I can anticipate conflicts around them. Yes. Right. Uh, so, Cyril Shroff, let me give you the final word on this. Of course, OECD pillars have been also spoken about, and there are many global institutions which are trying to create a cohesive atmosphere. What is the role that India can play in these global institutions in its own benefit? Sorry, uh, just to sort of build on the current theme, a lot of the future rivalry will be fought in terms of influence. And one of the favorite playgrounds for that will be international institutions, whether it's IMF, World Bank, WTO, WHO, and the G20. And India is going to be taking over the presidency of uh, G20 in the near future. So there is a huge opportunity. But what China has done over the years has been it has got very senior people in many of these global institutions. And India needs to do likewise. 
इट नीड्स टू गेट टू अ पोजिशन वेर वी बिकम अ रूल मेकर राधर दैन जस्ट अ रूल टेकर Yes. Uh, so yes. we have, and we have the we have an advantage. We have huge soft power because of our democracy, our sort of rule of law, and I mean we are fundamentally chalk and cheese when it comes to the comparison uh, with uh, with China. So there is a enormous opportunity for us to increase our influence in uh, global institutions, mm. and that will also set the base for the economic environment in which we can thrive. Look mm. what's happening to big tech in China, for example. that is such a massive opportunity for india as the as china is moving from its own previous version of chinese capitalism now to state capitalism that is the op- the golden opportunity for india to strike uh, at this point of time so uh, i i think we have uh, uh, it's it's a big transition that is taking place but it is full of opportunity That's right. On that positive note, uh, we wrap this uh, riveting discussion. Thank you so much, Janmeer Sinha, as well as Cyril Shroff, for joining us on this discussion. So the final word is that India sees a lot of opportunities, and how will it capture it is to be seen. Whether there'll be cold peace across the world in these changing dynamics of geopolitics and geoeconomics, and not to forget that some of the big indian business houses will play a big role for india to take big strides in this particular competition with that it's a wrap on this discussion thanks so much for tuning in to the thought leak siral amarchand mangaldas presents cnbc tv 80 the thought leak season 2 focus Innovate. Enable.